Okay, welcome everybody. We are thrilled to have you here. Um, we have a very exciting program lined up for you with a wonderful speaker. And um, we're going to be doing this a little bit different than we have in the, in the past. Um, we're gonna have quite a presentation and um, leading our presentation is going to be Kevan Geula. And um, many of you know her much better than I do, but I've been learning a great deal about her and I'm super excited to have her as our speaker. She is a licensed marriage, family and child therapist specializing in cognitive behavioral therapy and Baha'i inspired approach to mental health. She received her master's in science in marriage, family, and child therapy from the University of Laverne, California. And she offers her services as a clinician, international lecturer, trainer, and supervisor to a global set of clients. She is also the founder and executive of Center for Global Integrated Education, a nonprofit Baha'i-inspired educational organization which supports the online education of Baha'i Institute of Higher Education. She designs integrated education curriculums and teaches spiritual empowerment in public schools, inspired by Baha'i principles of oneness of humanity, elimination of all prejudices, and social emotional intelligence. And we are really thrilled to have you here, Kayvon. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. So um, we're going to uh, turn it over to Kayvon and let her start with her presentation. Um, I know that we have music involved and also many prayers and several illustrations. And um, we will also, Fariba and I will be trying to watch people as they raise their hands, as they have questions, but we expect most of the questions will come after the presentation. Okay, so thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Fariba. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm so excited to see so many friends from all over the place uh, joining us today. And um, I'm hoping that this presentation is not going to be very formal and heady, but rather experiential and fun and stories and stuff like that. So um, when you leave, there are something that you can take with you. Um, because I know myself when I go somewhere and it, it talks is all uh, cognitive. When I walk out of there 50 after a few hours, I don't even remember what was said. I just have a feeling about it, but I don't remember. So um, I am so delighted that we are talking about this whole concept of meditation from the science as well as the faith perspective. I have a long, long, long history of um, following this whole trend, it's a wish that has come after maybe 40 years, something like that. Um, I remember when I first um, decided and um, realized that I need to change my field of um, education. I used to be uh, an economic consultant with the government of Iran for some years. Um, and after I had my children, I decided that I need to really focus on how to raise a, um, a Baha'i child, how to raise someone that takes pride in serving humanity and does not get conflicted with all different races and classes and colors and stuff like that. And um, my first uh, daughter, who is uh, now a physician, and she's close to be 50. <laughs> she was born in Germany. <laughs> and um, then my, my son was born here in US. And then, and of course, in, uh, Nawal, my youngest, was also born in US. So uh, navigating the different cultures and making sure that these children are raised to be universal, global, and love everyone was, became the focus of my, um, my attempts and my work. So initially, as I, I saw David here, David Smith, um, I wanted to serve the faith and I decided, okay, that's how I'm going to do it. And 
Blue Helen was the, one of the Baha'i schools in Michigan, which I had the bounty of serving on its uh, uh, committee. And getting familiar how much we have to do in order to really call education, education. So very early for me, what we learn in schools, math and chemistry and um, sciences was really one wing of, uh, of education. The other wing was humanity. Who are we? Um, who do we become? The part that makes us connect with one another. Um, science does not give us values, basically. Science just gives us you know, how the elements in nature connect to one another and relate to each other. Uh, you say, okay, uh, if you put a seed in the ground and you give it water and you give it the sun and the earth is good, this seed has no other choice but to rise from the ground and eventually become an oak tree if this was an uh, oak seed. But to understand it, where to plant it, how to care for it, um, how to use it. All of that are the choices of the human soul because we are the only creation that not only we think, but we also can think about what we think. So therefore, we are the only creature on earth that have the whole maybe responsibility of choice and also and the, the reason we know we have is because we ask ourselves, should I or should I not? And when we say that, that means I have choice. And also regret. When we do something and then we are happy or we regret, that means we have choice. So these are, th this is unique to us. So I remember when I, when I came to, um, after in Michigan, came to Thank California, I was something. Oh, I think somebody has a microphone. <laughs> you can continue. I muted them. So I decided to um, to find a way to connect my knowledge, my my background of mis mystical background. Baha'i teachings is very mystical in nature. And I wanted to connect this mystical um, background with science and be able to have the language of science and the language of mysticism. I love the Persian poetry and um, between Persian poetry and the Baha'i writings, you're just in an ocean of mystic, mystical um, stories and knowledge and thought I wanted to see how I can use the language and the frame of science to connect with these two and put the two wings together and see what, what can happen. So I, I live in uh, Clermont, which is not too far from a city called Laverne, where there was a university not too far from me because my youngest was Nava was just five. So I didn't want to abandon her completely. So I wanted to be 15 minutes, that was okay. Um, so I went to um, apply for the Masters of um, Marriage Family Therapy. <laughs> the first thing the head of the department asked me, he said, why are you here? And I explained and I said, well, I have been um, uh, trained as an economist and uh, now I have children and I wanna make sure that from my background, which is spiritual and mystical, I can also bring in the science. And she got upset and she got mad and she said, don't you ever, ever mention the word spiritual here. And I was like kind of shocked because University of Laverne was um, initially uh, supported and started by the a branch of Christianity that are very spiritual and they, they really, um, brethren, and they are very open-minded. So I was kind of shocked that she's asking me not to even mention it. So I said, okay, I'll, I won't mention it, that's okay. So the whole years, four or five years of my education there, um, I just took whatever they had to give me. And I remember sometimes I would see my uh, classmates um, the program was really rattling. I mean, it was just 
just organizing everybody's mind. So I would see my classmate one after the other divorcing, divorcing their spouses and basically there was <laughs> this integration was going on because of the subjects that we were studying. It was so materially focused. It was so absolutely one win. I remember sometimes uh, after the class, I, I was serving on the spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Clermont. I would say, oh, wouldn't that be nice? I'm going to the assembly so I can hear some prayers and I can see unity. I can see a different spirit coming out after all this day of being in, in this frame that very, very rigid. Well, I tell you, um, this whole not the, the culture here, not wanting to do anything with spiritual concepts was very, very firm to the degree that I remember when I was working with schools, public schools, um, even in about maybe 10, 10, 15 years ago, maybe like that, you couldn't even mention the word meditation to be introduced to the school system. And now every school, you know, is having a meditation uh, workshop or class or something, things changed all of a sudden within a span of a few years. I remember 15 years ago, for the first time, I attended a conference in San Francisco, which was about um, spiritual concepts and mental health. So about 300 um, mental health professionals were attending. And I remember <laughs> very distinctly, you know, you forget things, but I remember that day that there was a speaker that was talking about it was from Italy and was talking about uh, to the mental health professional and says, you guys are too much stuck on this whole notion of yourself and this individual self. There is no individual self. We are all one. And the whole roar of the crowd was like, <laughs> that was like very bad mental shock. Among the, all the speakers, there was one woman from University of Arizona that very timidly, very cautiously gave a talk on meditation because meditation was not, not supposed to be science. And so it was, everybody was having rashes in hearing that. And I was so delighted. I said, gosh, you know, it's about time <laughs> we are entering into a realm when we, we can do some exploration of other aspects of human psyche. So fortunately, one wonderful um, entrepreneur, um, mental health professional, John Kabat-Zinn from Massachusetts decided, and these were a whole group of them actually, most of them from Jewish background. They all were going to India and coming back. By the way, I remember in 1969, I was in India and I would see a lot of um, American hippies would come to India and they were staying in the hostels in order to discover the spiritual secret from India. So that started from then. And about, uh, some of them after a while would become Baha'is because the, <laughs> they somehow they would, they would look something and they would find it somewhere else. So John Kabat Zen decided that he is going to market this um, Buddhist form of meditation without mentioning Buddhism at all because he didn't want, he realized that if he does that, <laughs> nothing will go on move forward. So he kind of sanitized it and made it secular and he introduced it as a form of relaxation exercise and mental health kind of on the side of mental health. And he introduced it very, very professionally and very skillfully. And he really sold it. And before you knew it, hospitals, the army, universities, and after a while the schools, and now it's everywhere, thank God. <laughs> now, when you see they are coming gradually and they are now talking about Buddhist psychology, which is great because Buddhism is one of the wonderful religions of the world and has so much wisdom just like all others and to share. So Buddhist psychology, now one of my colleagues has a most wonderful, wonderful, really um, comprehensive book that I have it on my, on my cell phone and I read, I, I listen to it and I explore it because I wanted to know how it is done. This is uh, from um, 
Ronald Siegel. These are the Siegels are many brothers and a lot of cousins, and they're all from Jewish background, one from, from UCLA, and all in different parts of the mental health. Uh, and do a wonderful job and a contribution to the whole field, which I'm so glad to see. But Ra's um, book, I would say probably has um, most of the um, progressive aspect of uh, mindfulness and meditation in it. So very, very close. It's very, very um, almost easy to uh, interchange it and uh, apply it as Baha'is. I don't see any part of it that I would say, oh, it doesn't match the, the Baha'i concept of thinking. Um, and the science part of it, they have done so much research now. So in the field of mental health, cognitive behavioral therapy approach has been probably the first and the closest that, they, that the mindfulness meditation used in conjunction together to help their patients. And now, of course, this is used um, um, by um, people in the entertainment business, every, everywhere. And I hear now, it's very interesting, I hear from the Baha'is all over the world as though it's, this is something new, which is for me very, very interesting because meditation uh, is nothing new to the Baha'i teachings. We have had always prayers and meditation as part of the daily routine of the Baha'i life. And I, I would like to read for you a passage from the um, Baha'i writing. It says, the capacity to meditate is a distinguishing feature of the human being. And I'll explain to you why. So I'm gonna uh, use this five-pointed star, which is for me, uh, because I do um, psychotherapy uh, with a Baha'i inspired um, wing to it. So these two for me work together. Uh, so I use this five pointed star, both used for CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and also for my understanding of the Baha'i writings. And I explain to you why. The upper um, zone of this five-pointed star is our sense perception. Um, how we receive the world. We see someone, we smell a flower, or we even smell um, other people, children, you know, they can, they, when they hug their parents, they talk about the, the smell of my mom or my dad and, and olfactory is a very powerful, force in human uh, senses. So we touch something and um, we, uh, so he, uh, eyesight, hearing, tasting, touching, what else I like of the, of the five senses? I think Maybe. you got them all. Hearing, huh? you got it, yeah, I think so. The five senses of touching. Smells. No. Taste, no, uh, smell, olfactory, yeah, you got it. Okay, so our senses are the way we connect with the material world. Um, and be, without them, really, we are not going to be able to see the beauty of a flower or a sunset or s smell it or taste food. Uh, we basically, we're very handicapped. So these are very important source of our connection with the material world. However, our senses are not really give, they do not really give us um, the true picture of reality. For example, we know of the whole notion of um, somebody standing uh, in a desert and at a distance, um, you see a body of water and you're thirsty. And then you walk and you walk and you go close and then there's no water, nothing. It's just the um, waves of the, of, of the heat and the air and everything. And it just fools your eyes. And so the, our senses can fool us in all kinds of different ways. And we can fight a lot as human beings over uh, what, what we are smelling or what is not smelling or um, what the sound is or what the sound is not. So this is not a point of unity 
in us as human beings, okay? Now, when we see something, we um, generally put it through a process that goes through our thoughts, then our feelings, our intention, what to do with it, and action. And I will explain. Abdu'l-Baha explains to us that our sense perception is a material faculty. These are our physical faculties. And we have also spiritual powers, which is our thoughts, our feelings, our intention, our comprehension. These are all, and our imagination. These are our spiritual powers. So I give you an example of how, um, how this process can work. And uh, sometimes, it can bring us together and sometimes can really tear us apart depending on how we process it. One of the, um, one of my um, patients who's not in this world anymore, <laughs> it was a wonderful, wonderful, rather young woman. She was about 30, 32 when first I saw her. This was like 30 some years ago. Um, she was uh, suffering from um, great depression and she was suicidal. And she was very cynical, but had a very great sense of humor. And very curious, very inquisitive. And because she was thinking about committing suicide, she was also um, very much in tune about what happened next world and why, why would anybody want to commit suicide? So we would, we would have this discussion with one another, trying to figure out how to basically um, walk with her in that exploration and yet at the same time win her back so she can live. She had the daughter and everything like that. Well, one day as she walked out of my office, um, somehow there was a meeting going on. She, and she, by the way, I was, and I would never talk to my patient who are not Baha'is that I'm a Baha'i. Unless they asked, maybe I would say, but I generally don't. So she walked out of my room, some, some committee somewhere nearby, maybe I think it was actually in the city of Laverne. They had a meeting on life after that and they have given me a flyer and I put the flyer outside of the door. <laughs> so. She, she walked by and this flyer had a very interesting picture of a, a tombstone with cracks on it. It was very dramatic. So it was very easy to notice. So she saw that and she thought, oh, what? life after death. So I, I want to go see, see where I'm going if I kill myself. So she took the flyer and she went over there to the meeting, I had no idea. And uh, somehow she told them where she found the, the flyer. And they said, oh, Kayvon, She's a Baha'i. She said, oh, look. OK, so she came back to me and she said, oh, you're a Baha'i. You better tell me all this. Anyway, so she just did her investigation. After a while, she came to me and she said, you know, I, I'm a Baha'i. I embrace the faith. I said, oh, OK, well, that's fantastic. Well, she said, but there's a problem. I said, what is the problem? She said, well, my old, old husband that you know, he's very old, and he's um, He's very, very, very religious, and he's very, very, very scared for me. I said, well, why is he scared for you? He's, she said, he thinks that I'm going to go to hell, not that I have become a Baha'i. And so he's trying so hard to convince me to come back and go to church and that kind of thing. As I said, she was very cynical, and she had a kind of bitter sense of humor. And so she wasn't going to listen. They didn't have a very good relationship. So she wasn't going to listen. So one day she came to me and, she, I saw, and, and I knew that sometimes she would get, and she was very big, big woman. She, she would get very upset and um, she, would, she would hit him. I said, you cannot ever do that. I mean, that's not allowed. So one day she came and said, um, I wanted to go to um, the feast tonight and I had, or a fireside tonight, and I had made a very beautiful chocolate cake. And um, she, by the way, she had two dogs and these dogs were just everything in her life. They would sleep in her bed and the two husband and wife, these two dogs were just their, their common threat between the two of them. Um, so she said, I made this chocolate cake and I put it in the counter. I came in to take it with me. There was a chunk of it gone. 
she saw that. The chunk of this cake was gone. She thought immediately, that jerk, the husband, has probably ruined this cake, so I would not be able to go. You can imagine she was feeling what? Extremely mad. She wanted to stand God as soon as, because he was in the garage. As soon as he comes in, she's going to hit him. And the door of the garage opens. She walks, he walks in. But guess who also walks in? The dog just comes in between his legs and she's got chocolate cake all over his face. Immediately seeing that, she has a different thought, immediately. And what do you think is that thought? Oh, my poor dog, he's gonna die. <laughs> and of course, she's feeling scared. She wants to do nothing but put him in the car, the two of them, take him to the vet, and that's what they do. So when you see that what we see, the cake being eaten, at one moment could be interpreted one way, oh, that jerk had eaten it, and create anger, create, one. Oh, I want to hit him, and go in that direction, which is hell. <laughs> and the other second, just because of another piece of information, completely there's another thought, which is, oh my goodness, my, my beautiful dog is gonna die. And if we worried about the dog and wanting to take him to the room. So this is the way our human brain basically processes quickly information and thought. So we have choice basically about the way we think. And this thought process is really most of the time the source of how we feel, what we want and what we do. Of course we have, thanks to neuroscience, we have another center in our brain that registers emotion is this um, uh, alarm system of the brain, which is amygdala, which is two almond shaped um, organs in both sides of our head. When something scary happens, for example, let's say if the dog jumps in the middle of the street, we don't anymore process it in our frontal lobe. It goes directly from here and alarm, and we don't even think we just jump in the middle of the street. We might not even think that the car might come and hit us. We go over there and to rescue the dog. So there is a different way that amygdala processes and traumas, for example, difficult things in life, for example, now I'm dealing a lot with the Baha'is of Iran, with all the trauma that's coming their way. Um, the, the process of dealing and um, healing trauma, um, which goes through the amygdala is completely different process. It's not the talk. It's not gonna work with talk therapy. I just want everybody to know because um, that's a, that's a, and the new frontiers of neuroscience that has really made such a difference in the whole field of mindful med meditation, all of that. Now, so this is important to know that whatever happens in the world does not necessarily decide how we feel about it and what do we want about it and what kind of action. It depends on what? The way we think about it, the way we think about it. Um, i give you another um, story example. This was a, from another one of the old um, neuroscientists, uh, Joan Borizenko. Yeah, she had a wonderful book called Minding the Body, Mending the Mind, many years ago, not like maybe 25 years ago, maybe. And uh, so she was the one of the early ones. So in her book, she shares this story of um, uh, how, how you go and hunt uh, a monkey. So obviously, just like every advertisement has to know what we are, we have a soft spot for, and um, they would use that part of us and they would basically throw and get us in the trap and we can put our hand in, the, in our pocket and dash out the money. That's how it works. So monkeys are no different. So um, one, the hunter wanted to uh, hunt a monkey, what they, what they would do goes, and what is the monkey like? What is it that monkeys love very much? Everybody knows. Banana. Bananas. <laughs> so he goes, the, the, this, this uh, hunter goes and puts a banana, makes, takes a gourd, makes a little hole, enough for a monkey to put his hand in it. 
and um, puts a banana in there and then ties this gourd to a tree and he goes and stands way far away so the monkey cannot smell him. So the monkey smells the banana and thinks, oh, there is a banana somewhere around here. And he's feeling very excited and he wants to go get the banana. And the action is towards the tree and the banana puts his hand in there and grabs hold of the banana and now his hand is what? Much bigger. And he starts to get his hand out of there. He wants to eat the banana, it's not coming out. And then he's seeing at the distance, the hunter is coming. And he thinks, oh my goodness, death is coming my way. He's feeling scared. He wants to run away, but being an animal, he just keeps putting his head. He cannot think about what he's thinking. He cannot let go of the banana. And because he cannot let go of the banana, the hunter will come and grab his neck and go make a nice meal out of him. A lot of times I use this story for my patient when they get angry or they get upset or they get stuck on a thought about their children, about their spouses, about their neighbors, about whatever it is that, and they don't wanna let go of that thought, which is really the epitome of attachment. So our attachment is not so much about the, the car, is not so much about the house or so, so much about the clean, cleanliness of the house, but the way we think about it, that we are willing to um, be harsh, be upset, be angry about the way, the way somebody else is acting and the way we think about it. So the whole notion of meditation, mindfulness meditation is about observing these way of thinking that Baha'u'llah calls them wayward thoughts, wayward thoughts. But why is he calling it wayward? Because these are thoughts, because the Baha'i concept of life, Baha'i concept of this life and end of the life and where we go is all about being able to manifest and show our God-like self, our universal self, the self that loves people, the self that forgives, the self that serves others, the self that sees humanity as one. That is the kind of thought and values the Baha'u'llah teaches. And when we think in the direction of separating ourselves from somebody else because of some material things, then it's considered in, in the mindset of the Baha'i monks, mindset is called wayward thought. So he says, so I'm gonna read that passage again. The capacity to meditate is a distinguishing feature of the human being. Because why? Because not only we think, but because we have two selves, one is the spiritual self and one is the lower self, the animal self. Our spiritual self, our godlike self, draws us to the heavenly attributes. And our animal self basically is very happy with being like a lion or being like a dog or a cat or a giraffe, you know? The lion walking in the savannah and sees a deer with a baby deer is gonna say, oh, that is a very nice meal for my children. We have not eaten for all week. And he's gonna feel very excited and grateful to God for that. And intention is find the right strategy to get that deer, whatever it is, and action is charge. The lion is not gonna go back and say, oh, that was not very nice. I killed that deer and now Bambi is running around by itself without any parent. It's not gonna do that because the lion does not have the capacity to think about what he thinks and also does not have the capacity to have moral judgment about no, this was not the right thing to do. I should have thought something else. I should have, you know, went and say hello to the deer and see if they can, we can come sit and do something. That doesn't happen. It's our responsibility and it's only unique to us. So the capacity to meditate is a distinguishing feature of the human being. Indeed, human progress, spiritual, material, or social, would be impossible without reflection and contemplation. Reflection and contemplation. And this is from Baha'u'llah. 
and the source of craft, sciences, and arts is the power of reflection. So this was mm, mm, given to humanity, at least the Baha'i faith is about 176 years or whatever. So it was all there. So the whole world of meditation, the, the whole notion of reflection, meditation was there. Um, the prayers for the first time in the whole history of actually religions, um, when we look at, we see in um, Judaism, there are no prayers from Moses that I know of. In um, Christianity, there is one prayer from Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. The rest of the prayers, of course, saints and others have um, given it or said it. Mm, and the same with all, in Islam, there, there is an obligatory prayer, but no, no prayers from Muhammad that we can. Now comes the time of Bab and Hawla. We have oceans upon oceans of prayers. And we ask, why? What is it about this, this whole ocean released on humanity? And we, um, thanks to neuroscience, we hear that um, um, the book from um, Andrew Neuberg, another neuroscientist, says, God changes your brain. God changes your brain. You ask, what does that mean? Actually, literally, it means whatever we think, every time we think a way, we rewire our brain in that way. That means the wiring changes. So therefore, almost new pathways for thinking are created every time we think. So whenever we go and read a prayer, the patterns of thought in that prayer, the way the messages of that prayer basically rewires our brain. It educates, educates us and gives us choices about what else and how else to think. What else and how else to think. So when, when I go sit down, my obligatory prayer, you know, long obligatory prayer, if I say it, I would stand and I would focus and I look to the left, I look to the right. And then I start saying the prayer as I'm focusing on the metaphors of this prayer. By the way, thoughts generally is in the form of pictures. So I say to you, don't think about a short giraffe or don't think about a pink elephant. <laughs> the first thing that comes to your mind is <laughs> a giraffe or a pink elephant because don't does not register with our brain. So don't go tell your children, don't think about you know, sex or don't think about that because don't does not register with us. So yeah, our thought in, is in, in, the, in the form of um, pictures. So metaphoric thinking, by the way, this was another interesting development not too many years ago. Some scientists from UC Berkeley wrote a book about, uh, I had it here somewhere in here, about uh, metaphors, metaphors in our life. For the first time, I remember I had a patient many years ago, was a professor of uh, theology and um, a beautiful soul, a wonderful soul and uh, was coming because she was worried about her son. And um, she was worried because this son, um, and, and he was just fine. I saw him, he was fine, but she was worried about him. And I said to him, her, you know, you just kind of leave her, leave him alone. <laughs> and he, she said, I can't, I'm just worried about him all the time. I'm thinking about all the things that he might do wrong. I said, okay, why don't you just find a prayer and say this prayer for him? She said, I don't know any prayer. I don't have any prayers. I don't even say prayers. I said, well, but you're a professor of theology. Uh, she said, yeah, well, I'm teaching theology. But I'm not even believing in God. So, okay. I said, well, I don't have anything. I just have Baha'i prayers. If you want me, I can give you <laughs> one of the Baha'i prayers for the youth. Make this youth radiant and confer thy bounty upon this poor creature. I can give you that. She said, okay, that'd be fine. So she gets the prayer and she... Or maybe I gave, even gave her the prayer book, my, lended my prayer book. I said, you go find something in there. So she goes and she comes back and she says to me, this was by, about 30 years ago. She says, wow, you know, this, this, the whole language is so flowery. I've never seen a language so flowery. <laughs> she, wasn't even, she wasn't even saying metaphoric or anything like that because it was not the norm. So these progresses, which has been wonderful, these years made me very, very delighted because I feel a lot more at home to be speaking about these concepts of the faith and the science of mental health because now everybody knows metaphors. So our thoughts are in the form of 
pictures. When we hear a metaphoric language, we see a lot of pictures in the Baha'i writing, and then we focus on those pictures, it changes our brain. So when I say um, with great attention, make my prayer a fire. The first thing I'm, I'm coming across is what kind of a fire is it? Is it big? Is it small? Is it red? Is it yellow? Is it the whole house? Is it just a candle? So every time I say this prayer, a different form of fire comes to my mind. So make my prayer a fire, and then Baha'u'llah tells us what the fire will do. That will burn away the veils that have shut me out from thy beauty. Basically, right at the beginning of this whole prayer, I'm discovering, first, what do I want to ask God? Remove the veil, please. <laughs> Why do I want the veil to be removed? I want to see God's beauty. That is the beginning of my day. That is the quest of my day. That is teaching me how to start my day. And then halfway through the prayer, I say, <laughs> do not look upon my hopes and my doings. Nay, rather, look upon thy will that has encompassed the heavens and the earth. I mean, we go, we go around the whole day, keep asking for this, I want this and I want that, and do this and do that. God, don't do that. God, do this. But here I am right there every single day. I say, do not look upon my hopes and my doings. Nay, rather look upon thy will that has encompassed the heavens and the earth, okay? So by the way, I'm gonna keep my eye on the time, which is your time and my time are different. So, okay. So, um, the, um, Fariba John, where, how far, how, where are we from this 45 minutes? Because I wanna make sure that- We're good, we're good. How much time do I have before I, Come to the 45 minutes. So you want to do another 15 minutes, 20 minutes? Yeah. So, so metaphoric language lends itself um, perhaps the best to the whole idea of um, rewiring human brain, according to neuroscience. And I have to give you this wonderful information about the whole world of imagination, that's another thing that was discovered because of um, neuroscience. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about the whole um, science about mirror neurons. I, if you haven't watched it, I would suggest there is a wonderful 10, 12, 12 minute video by Nova on YouTube called Mirror Neurons. That I would definitely suggest for you to watch because it really gives you a lot of information about who how you operate in this world and what powers we have. So anyway, the story goes, um, some scientists wanted to know what in the brain, what neurons in the brain are connected to our motor neuron actions. When we do something, when we play the piano, when we run, when we go grab a cookie from the cookie jar, what neurons in the brain fire so they could you know, identify that. So they, would, they had this, monkey sitting and in front of the monkey was a table and they had three peanuts sitting on the rest on the on the table every time the monkey would go to pick up the brain of the monkey the head was all wired and everything like that um some place in the head of the monkey would buzz and then no, the scientists said, oh yeah this is the this is the motor neuron in the brain of the monkey so they were fine with that okay so monkey moves his hand and the the, the neuron buzzes no big deal. After a while, the monkey was sitting and uh, uh, one of the scientists is that, oh, the, these peanuts are not well, you know, placed on the table. He reaches out to move the, the peanut and the monkey's brain goes buzz. And now they are, you know, that's a good thing about scientists and we have to be, we need to be curious. <laughs> so a lot of time, unfortunately, we, instead of being curious, our thought takes us towards being furious. So we gotta change our thought. The minute we get, we get furious, we need to go back and say, what else could I be thinking? So I become curious because curiosity is like an in the independent investigation of truth. Baha'u'llah well, says, you're here to be learning, to be curious. Don't, don't waste your time in being furious. You know? So they become curious. So what happened here? How come his brain is buzzing and we did the action? The monkey didn't move. Anyway, so they discovered that this, this neuron in the brain, to it, it doesn't make any difference if it is 
action, if it is our imagination, imagining that we are moving the peanut or moving the peanut, imagining that we are playing the piano or we are really playing the piano or seeing somebody else doing it. It's all the same. All of them rewires our brain, all of them. So somebody could be sitting and actually it's a true story. Somebody was with a, a wonderful pianist was in the prison for many years and every day, whatever, uh, the Baha'is of Iran know what, what can happen in the solitary for four years. One of my friends, Raha Sabit, who's now in Norway, she was in solitary for four years because she was serving the community. So she, she was telling us what she did there in order to protect her brain from going crazy. So the first thing she decided, she said, she just recited the prayers, remove her difficulties. Is there any remover of difficulties, save God, for every single warden, the, the judge, the prisoner, whatever, the friends, outside, inside, because we have day and night, you can't tell. She said there was a light, dim night going on, on all the time. You did not know there was no windows. You did not know what time it is, what day it is, nothing. And this whole time being there, you could go crazy. So some sort of a routine, some sort of a semblance, she started thinking positive thoughts. That was the only for 100 times for every person. And she would count them in order to be able to have some sort of a sanity and order. So mirror neurons um, gave us a lot of interesting, fascinating knowledge about ourselves that as human beings, we need to respect our imagination, or respect our thoughts, because that's a lot, a lot of times the sources of how we feel about life and the intention. Meditation is for us to be able to um, recognize the thoughts that we think. So a lot of meditative processes started with just, you know, just noticing the thought. Another variation was notice the thought, but go get the thought and bring it over, just like a kid who goes there and bring it over. Now they're making a lot of um, new changes in the whole process, which a lot of it is similar to cognitive behavior therapy approach. So in that approach of cognitive behavior therapy, we, the therapist um, hopefully has a good relationship with the patient. And as a result, the therapist could introduce or ask for a new form of thought, alternate thought, and the patient itself say, oh, I want to go, go on the note. <laughs> I had one patient, she, she was, um, she got ma mad and she was a borderline personality. She, I said, what did you do? She said, I went to, to the um, open, uh, broke into the uh, home of my boyfriend um, and I took his dog and took it to the pond. I said, oh my goodness, oh my good, I mean, so, can you can you can you convince this person to have an alternate thought? It was not that easy. I can tell you that. Later on, I discovered that she had a very soft spot for um, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, her Christian beliefs. Thank God. So through that, I was able to gradually kind of uh, help her to take another direction because uh, she had a very special relationship with Christ. So that's something when you have something to lose when you have something dear to your heart, when you have a very strong relationship that always can mm, convince you to take a direction. So this whole notion, this, so men, mindfulness meditation wants us, there are all these variations. First to recognize what we are thinking. So we are not impulsive. So we are not you know, going with the a destructive form of thought. So we are giving ourselves time. So we are slowing down. And so hopefully if the thoughts are the kind of thoughts that creates anxiety to go back and find something else or we create depression the same way. So some of it would be mental health processes, the, the whole looking at the thought. And the other one would be um, to, for the person to be able to be, if they wanna be creative, if they wanna be calm, if they wanna be, um, have less uh, you know, blood pressure, all of those things, health, business, all of that. Now everything, everything is now uh, has a component of mindfulness meditation into it. Schools have it, uh, hospitals have it. Um, so uh, the, the part that 
to me distinguishes the Baha'i style of meditation in my mind is that the kind of thought that we go and find and, and tune into are from the Baha'i writings. And these kind of thoughts um, distinguishes between the two parts that we have, the Darth Vader and the Luke Skywalker in us, because we all have it. Or Dr. Hyde and Mr. Mr. Hyde, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, we all have it. There's nobody who doesn't have um, the animal side who's in this, on this earth. And the other thing is the whole concept, the knowledge that comes in the Baha'i writing about life after death. And I would definitely recommend to the friends to um, visit and study the a very unique, less, less studied tablet called Tablet of Hakonos. Uh, so the, somebody asked, how do I uh, write appear in the next world? Like, what do I take from this world as far as my account, my credits here? Because I can't take my money, I can't take my house. What do I take on the other side so I can make sure that I'm not wasting my time because I'm not gonna be here forever. So this is like a, you know, a hotel. You're coming in from this side and you enter from the other side after 100 years, where are gonna be any of us after 100 years? None of us going to be in this shape or form. So this whole notion of what happens in the Y writings and knowing that it makes a big difference in the way we carry ourselves and the way we manage our thoughts. And so in our meditation, we see a lot in the Y writings, hear no evil, see no evil. Um, love all mankind, love all humanity, serve everyone. All religions are one. All humanity is one. Um, you are like the cells of one body. All of these ways of thinking, um, or um, actually it says, um, one place Abu Ha says, when somebody else prays for you, it's a lot more effective than you pray for yourself. Well, because the whole structure mindset of the Baha'i teaching is about cohesion of the society and being connected to one another and uh, if, I, if I can win somebody's, uh, earn somebody's prayers, I have to do something nice to be able to do that. And that makes me a better human being. And then the connection between the, us makes the society a much better society. So, Ivan Jan, um, just um, to let you know, um, it's almost eight o'clock. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop right here. So, we, because we, we decided that we're gonna have an experience of meditation and, and how that works. Um, when I work with my uh, patient or my students, I ask them um, always to come to the session selecting a prayer. I say, you select a prayer, whatever you think that speaks to what you want to discuss. And sometimes I have a couple. I remember one time I, t I told this couple they were very upset with each other. I said, could you both come with a prayer that you selected? was very, very illuminating to me. The one of them selected a prayer that had to do with unity. The other one, the prayer that had to do with, the, with assistance. So that just told me that these two coming for two different things, but very much bringing them together. So I knew that they are working in the direction of reconciling and helping. So that saved me a lot of time and saves them a lot of time. And they, they have their mandate right there and they identify with that. that fantastic. And it really takes me out of the equation as far as the therapist, the authority. So I'm no longer the authority, but just kind of a convener. So what we are going to do is, um, um, since we, we cannot be asking you to choose a prayer, it's not going to be practical. So what we decided is I selected a prayer that has a lot of concepts in it that has, as one of my students say, I never knew that there are keys in the Baha'i prayers. Yes, there are keys about how to think and what to think and how not to think and what to look for and how to navigate ourselves in, in, the, in the spiritual realm. So I selected this prayer that I really, really love very much. And it just so happens that some 30 years ago, I was in Greenacre teaching the Baha'i school and there was a wonderful musician, uh, Rosemary Peterson, most angelic voice. She had this CD called In Tone and in this um, prayer was one of them, and we're going to be hearing it today. But before we do that, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. So um, Ruth is going to, um, I'm going to give you instruction of what's going to be happening. And before we, um, I start the activities of um, mindful meditation, 
uh, Ruth is going to be saying that prayer, just reciting it. And then I'll take you into a whole system of relaxation, imagery. And at the end of the imagery, then we're going to be hearing the same prayer song by Rosemary Peterson. So I want you to mm, focus on it at the beginning when Ruth is saying it. So you can tune into some of the words and some of the metaphors and see what happens. Then we do the relaxation, we will do the imagery, and then you hear the prayer again, song to you. And you can take a little bit of time to, in your mind, to really tune into what, are, what is happening to your thoughts, what kind of thoughts you, are you entertaining, how are you feeling about those thoughts, what do you want to do with those thoughts, what kind of action you would like to take. Because without action, by the way, meditation is useless. Because in this world of existence, the way we make a difference is by action. Our thoughts is just like waves of the sea. It doesn't do anything, it just foams. So it needs the thought that translates into action, it would make a difference. Whether you're serving somebody, you're doing something nice, you're doing not something not nice, <laughs> it's always about the action. So reflecting on the thought and asking yourself, you know, what, what am I feeling about these thoughts? What do I want to do with them? That would be it after the, you, see, you hear the song. Then we come back and we process it and see what happened. So you guys are going to be telling us what was this experience like as meditation. So the first part um, is going to be mm, root saying it. The second part, you'll be hearing me directing you in the process of relaxation, physical, mental relaxation. The third part would be an imagery. The fourth, you hear the music. The fifth, you will be reflecting on passages in the words of that song. So I'm hoping that you have the sequence, right? Okay, so we are ready for Ruth. Your voice is not coming, Ruth. It's, you're muted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is Intone, O oh My Servants, the Verses of God. Intone, O oh My Servants, the Verses of God that have been received by Thee, as intoned by them who have drawn nigh unto Him, that the sweetness of Thy melody may kindle Thine own soul and attract the hearts of all men. Whoso reciteth in the privacy of his chamber the verses revealed by God, the scattering angels of the Almighty shall scatter abroad the fragrance of the words uttered by his mouth, and shall cause the heart of every righteous man to throb, though he may at first remain unaware of its effect, yet the virtue of the grace thou saveth unto him must need sooner or later exercise its influence upon his soul. Thus have the mysteries of the revelation of God been decreed by virtue of the will of him, who is the source of power and wisdom. So now I would like for all of you, wherever you are, to find a comfortable way of sitting. Preferably, you want to have your, if you're sitting on a chair, making sure that your feet are both touching the mother, the ground, secure. Your body is comfortable, but upright. You're not slouching. You're not in a position where you want to fall asleep because it's hard to fall asleep and meditate. So I want you to take a few slow and deep breaths. And as you take an inhaling, and then you exhale slowly and completely. And for the second time, take a slow and deep breath. And exhale slowly and completely. And for the third time, 
See if you can take a deep, slow breath. And exhale slowly and completely. And for the four times, take a deep, slow breath. And as you exhale, notice your shoulders dropping and your fingers more relaxed. So now we're going to start checking little by little different parts of our body just by the difference to see if our parts of our body is relaxed. So let's start with the toes, the feet. If you have a shoe or if you have your bare feet, it's okay. I want you to tighten the muscles of your feet. Just a few times, tighten and loose them, open and shut them, the, the fingers, the toes. And then finally, tighten these muscles as tight as you can and take a deep, slow breath. And as you exhale, I want you to let loose these muscles and feel the difference and just check and see. So now the muscles of your legs all the way up to your thighs and buttocks to see if you can tighten these muscles and take a deep, slow breath. And then when you exhale, just let loose these muscles and you can almost feel the warmth of the blood running to every single cell. So the muscles of your back, your stomach, up to your shoulders, see if you can straighten your up a little bit yourself and tighten these muscles and take a deep, slow breath. And then you exhale, let your muscles loose and just let your shoulders drop. The muscles of your fingers, all the way up to your arm and shoulders, just open and shut your hand, your fingers a few times back and forth. And finally make a very strong, tight fist and take a deep, slow breath. And now open your fingers and loose and relax and just let them rest on your lap and feel every single cell in your fingers feels the warmth of the blood. And finally, we come into the muscles of your face. This is an organ that really has the most muscles, almost about 200 muscles. So we can do a lot of expressions with our face. I want you to pretend there is a fly sitting at the tip of your nose and without touching it with your hand, you're going to move and squeeze every single muscle in your face so this fly could feel that it needs to get off your nose. So squeezing every single muscle in your face and taking a deep, slow breath. Now let loose these muscles and let your face relax, your body is whole, relaxed. So now you are really all from the toe to the head. Feel very relaxed and ready to travel in your mind's eye. So I want you to find in your mind a place wherever you think is the place for you, a place where you feel happy, a place where you feel at peace, a place where you feel free, a place where you feel safe, and a place where you have the ability to see far, far as you want to see. So once you selected this place, I want you to picture in your mind 
that you were going to be a very light, special light being with wings. And you decide what is going to be that being. Is it a bird? Is it an insect? Whatever it is, it's a has the ability to fly, go far and wide. So in a few seconds, I want you to get yourself ready and take off from where you are. So you are able to see what is beneath your feet and scan the place and notice all different vegetations, all different sceneries, all different terrains. Is it green? Is it a desert? Is it maybe ocean? Do you see a body of water in your form? How does the air feel to you? How high are you? I want you to feel as though with your mind looking down, you can find all the places, all the elements that lift your soul, your spirit, and brings joy to your heart. Everything down there is so small, but you have wings, and you find a place that you want to be near it. You can always come closer. Notice if you are able to smell the fragrances, hear the sounds. What kind of sounds can you hear? What kind of fragrances can you smell? And soon, after you having a nice scan of the whole area, I want you to go as high as possible, as high as possible. When you look back from the earth, you see the most beautiful blue marble. Notice what are some of your thoughts and priorities? What are some of your wishes? What do you want to do with the rest of the time you have on this plane of existence? Keep soaring. And as you're soaring, you're going to be hearing the same prayer song by Rosemary Peterson with a beautiful angelic voice. I want you to pay attention to the words and see what appeals to you and what it means to you.
Okay, my friend, now time to come back on earth, back to earth. So this is a good time to have, to hear your reflections, your thoughts, what happened, what was the experience like, um, questions, so all of that. So your turn. Thank you, Kayvon. Um, if you, if uh, anyone would like to speak, just unmute yourself and then back to mute again, if you don't mind, when you're done. Go ahead, Paula, please. With, with all of this focus on intoning, I just uh, felt this rising of hmm, like this. And frankly, I want to go and play the piano right now. <laughs> so. That's the action that for me must eventuate from this wonderful relaxation and the soaring and the extending my spirit outwards. I, I think that's the image I would share. Thank you, Paula. Yes, thank you. Anyone else?
I'm still in trance. <laughs> I think for me, um, the when I chose what winged animal I wanted to be, I chose um, a dragonfly. <laughs> And at first, the, the place that I chose to be was um, at my parents' house, which is on a lake. It's a lake that I grew up on, and it's, it's very beautiful. And we do get a lot of dragonflies out there. Um, and I could see myself as the dragonfly. I was kind of like an iridescent blue flying around. And then as I got higher and higher and I visited the different places, the the place I kept coming back to was, um, it was almost like uh, Hawaii or, or a place like that. And there were beautiful flowers and I could really see and smell the flowers as I was going from place to place. And I could hear the, the children playing on the beach nearby. And it just kind of, um, it took me away from a very stressful week that I had had and, and different concerns that I was having about people in my life and, uh, and those that I care about. It was like a mini vacation. <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Ruth. Yes, we have that ability. That is one of our powers. The power of imagination really is no different than being there or going there. So in this, especially during this uh, COVID-19, we got to have to take these prayers and take um, on the wing of these prayers, go places and um, be realities and go far as we want and open up our horizon and see the world and, and wish um, good things for others and make sure that we know that Bahá'u'lláh says that, that the sweetness of our melody kindles our own soul and attracts the heart of all men. It attracts the heart. So using this power um, gives us, empowers us during this time that a lot of us feel um, powerless, basically. Thanks for sharing that. That was wonderful. <laughs> Hi. Diana, this is my very first time um, trying to kind of meditate and the first thing I felt was the tension of my body, the tension of my muscles and how breathing helped me and the way I was, I, I focused and concentrated and I relaxed. And I saw myself as a perk of light, like light, and I went back to the river walk, a, play, a place I love. I saw the trees, I saw the trail, I was able to feel the air, the cold air. I kind of, like the memories came back to me from this morning, and I kept going back and forth, smelling flowers. And it was just, and it was beautiful. It was amazing. And thank you. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate that. Salman has his hand up. Thank you, Ruth. Um, um, thank you so much, Kayvon John. This was wonderful. Um, just one thing I was going to share was like, before doing the meditation, I had some pain. And I feel like after doing the meditation, um, the pain went away. Um, I feel more relaxed. Mm -hmm. and like by listening to the words, the powerful words and observing my thoughts, I was able to change my mood. And I almost feel like, you know, um, I'm, I can say happier, even a little happier than I was an hour ago. Thank you. That's <laughs> wonderful. Now you have to remember, in in, in the, the the original form, I ask people to search for a prayer. So it will take them a while to go through the prayer book, and they can find. So when they find, they have already serendipity has taken them through many vistas, 
and then they have found themselves in that phrase. Basically, that's what they're they have been doing, finding themselves at that moment because they're looking for thoughts which is they can relate to. And our reality, Abdul Baha says, is our thought. Um, of course, we have the lower self reality too, right? so that like, we're, we're taught. So we need to look. So the Baha'i writings basically gives us the patterns of our spiritual thoughts. So once you find that, you have a relationship with that thought. So when you say that prayer, it is a really a journey that you have created much of it. So um, I'm glad that you are able, all of you so far are able, have been able to um, experience your own um, spiritual and mental powers. Um, and that should tell us how much we are able to navigate um, without material means, basically. These are, these are spiritual powers, they have nothing to do with anything material, none. And much of what we saw, by the way, and Paola in one fascinating tablet, Loha Hagonos, talks about the dream world, by the way, that this is another mystery that has not yet been discovered. Um, how every night when we fall asleep, we go closest as possible in this world to the next world. And once in a while, we have true dreams. That means the dream that exactly happens in this world. I don't know if any of you have that heard yourself or others have had true, true dreams that you don't need even interpretation. These Basically, it's the soul becomes aware of things happening outside of time and place. And that is fascinating to know. And so Baha'u'llah gives a whole many interesting explanations about um, the powers that we have and what happens um, as we uh, awake. So he says, you, we cannot stop falling asleep. Everybody falls asleep every night. If you don't, we will die if we keep ourselves awake for a long time. And when we fall asleep, Baha'u'llah well, says, we wake up. We can avoid getting out of bed, but we wake up. That's not voluntary. So falling asleep, getting, waking up is not voluntary. And he says, for the same parallel, we cannot avoid dying, we die. And when we die, we rise. That, when I read that the first time, I said, oh my goodness, there's no doubt in my mind anymore because this experience of falling asleep and rising every, every 24 hours is like real. So yeah, our mind, our, our spiritual powers uh, can take us places out of the prison of our own lower self. And the writing is the wing that we take and we fly with it, we know, we know that's a spiritual self. Nevanjan, I think Natalie has a, had her hand up. Okay. Natalie, go ahead and unmute. Hi. <laughs> I just wanted to quickly um, still share what my, uh, where my imagination took me. <laughs> and just to that add, it was, it was a really, um, it was a really nice experience for me um i i think i have a one-year-old daughter which is here and i imagined really this sense of like awe and wonder and excitement about everything that she sees and kind of like took that on myself and i imagined um, her on a flying unicorn <laughs> going around saying wow to everything <laughs> So it was, I was just was so like giggly and like my action I wanted to take was to kind of keep, <laughs> no, keep like, like looking at the whole world and nature with that sense of wonder and awe. This one. Thank you, Natalie. By the way, Natalie is, is really, really a spiritual daughter to me and I have, seen and worked with Natalie. She worked with me to design the curriculum that we implemented at public schools for five years and then come back and evaluate that curriculum in the process. And she was one of the people, the stars of implementation at public schools in Pomona. So she has been a wonderful companion and a friend and daughter and just watched her just bloom and now she has this wonderful other wing 
um, Manfred, and, and then of course, Emily, I cannot tell you how delighted I am every time I see Natalie. Uh, and then she has a cousin also, Valerie, also married to an Austrian, she's in Austria. So one of the gifts uh, that I have been fortunate to have to get to know these, these two, and now four of them, because there's Manfred, Natalie, Valerie, and uh, Mo. <laughs> and now Emily. <laughs> so Nat Natalie, so, so wonderful to see you. Family reunion here. I love it. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Any other questions? There's a, um, there's a question on the chat from Paula in regards to um, some clarification of the name of the tablet you referred to earlier, Kevan. Okay. okay, I think I think that's um, called Hakonos, which is um, a tablet by Bahá'u'lláh. It is uh, for the Persians. You can find it in Kitabe, the book Ma'edei Asimani. Volume seven, uh, pages probably 122 or 120 and on. Uh, there is a um, provisional translation by Dr. Ghassami also online. And uh, I will try to send that the, the links to Fariba and Fariba will be able to send it. It's a tablet I realized very few guys <laughs> have studied it and read it, but boy, it absolutely completely woke me up <laughs> it was and i have been reading it over and over because it has some some very 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 eye-opening material in it so i would definitely suggest you deepen on it within 20 within the next 24 hours i would uh, um send everyone who has signed in a copy of today's um um, video and also reference and and also the um, the fine five pointed uh, instruction that uh, Kavon had. So they uh, look for it within the next twenty four hours. Right. By the way, this five pointed star we used it uh, with the students, elementary school students, and also the high school students for the five years. And they this was one of their favorite um, tools to basically. Um, evaluate themselves to see how if they're processing um, the world, when, what happens, what, is, what are the thoughts they choose, and can they have alternate thoughts? And you guys think that is easy? <laughs> I've had some patients, you know, who really, scientists especially, I mean, they cannot think one other thought than, than what they think. It's just one thought, and that's about it. <laughs> and if that thought is not a good one, <laughs> they're in trouble. <laughs> but what can I, <laughs> it doesn't matter how many times I ask, can you think of any other way about this? And they're just like, no, they're just stuck in that little box. So having alternate thoughts, I think, is one of the things that we develop pers personally, I think, as a result of um, the daily prayers, because it gives you alternate thoughts. So, but meditation by itself, maybe there's a therapist who would do, but by itself, you have to go figure out what alternate thoughts, but uh, doing your meditation based on the Baha'i writings, you have all, you choose the alternate thoughts before even you sit down. So maybe you are talking about, you are looking for forgiveness, looking for, um, you know, somebody who upset you and what else can you be thinking about that person? All of those things. It is your choice. It's your going and finding the flower or the medicine that you are looking for, and then you applying it to your own mind and heart and go free. Yes. Thank you. Um, there was another um, a reference to the tablet. Uh, someone was asking, uh, what is the name of the tablet in English? Uh, again, I will send that to you uh, in the email. Yeah, the name is Hagonos, and his translation is also translated as Hagonos. Hag means right, Nos means in Arabic people. So basically, somebody asked Baha'u'llah, how, you know, how is God handling our rights in the next world? What happens when I enter over there? What are my ledgers like? <laughs> what are the things to my credit, and what are the debits in my account? <laughs> so Baha'u'llah is giving a many, many many stories and examples uh, to make sure that that person understand. Uh, if I had in, in time, I would love to do it, maybe one day just a separate um, course, just separate thing about just the Hagwan loss because it's very fascinating, very, very um, awakening. Thank you. Michael has his hand up. 
Actually, Nadia had her hand up, so Nadia, I, I was sorry. just, uh, yes, please. Thank you, Michael. By the way, Nadia is my sister. Hello, Nadia from Hello. Arizona. My Hello. gorgeous friend also. <laughs> uh, this, I, I'm sorry I, I logged on kind of late, but I feel like I came on just in time uh, for the meditation and uh, eh, it certainly took me back. Uh, I'm not going to age us, but uh, took me back to uh, Sunday school at your home, our <laughs> weekly Sunday school classes at your home. So thank you. Um, and the more I kept thinking about my happy place is literally among the waves in the ocean. And it, it, I just kept going there. And I, I was trying to figure out why, why am I constantly, am I feeling like, am I feeling true happiness? Is that my true bliss being in the ocean and, and the elements? And um, as you were navigating us through it, uh, it, it just uh, brought, helped me to really relax and really let go of the, day-to-day -day madness of this week and uh, it made me think wow every Friday night I really need to do something like this so that I can have a true fresh mind for the weekend for my time for time of service um, and uh, to just be able to be more refreshed for the weekend so it just uh, I, I feel completely energized so thank you <laughs> So glad to By the way, um, there is a National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United Kingdom. Ask a very um, experienced um, meditator, meditation teacher, um, Paul Profasco, to write a, guide, a guidebook and a meditation book and CD he made. It's called Calm. So I just recently, initially it was published by George Ronald. Um, recently, um, we used it with Natalie and all that for our course. Natalie knows probably Natalie Valley. We, we use that, and also my students in Iran. I I have for them also because I teach meditation to them. Um, but um, I recently saw that um, Amazon has it. But so you guys can figure out either from Amazon or from uh, George Ronald. Um, it's called Calm meditation. So he uses the Baha'i writings and the Baha'i understand his Baha'i understanding in um, uh, put together this book on meditation. So I would definitely recommend that. Thank you. And of course, you would put that in the reference uh, that I'll, I'll be sending to everyone. I'll try to remember. I appreciate <laughs> I'll remind you. <laughs> we have about uh, another 10 minutes. Any? Um... Michael, Michael was one here. Michael? I don't want to forget you, Michael. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I, I've been meditating for as long as I've been a Baha'i and before then uh, through and taught yoga for many years. Uh, the music thing is, is critical. And I'm so pleased that, that uh, Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha have emphasized music. Uh, the concept of your style of meditation is, is very helpful for people that haven't done it. But the Baha'i scriptures are pretty explicit that there's not a single form of meditation that's being taught. Yes. So it's developing uh, the things that feel good. So for me, you know, the, the muscular tension and the release, those are, are very, very basic yogic meditation techniques. Um, and actually, I, I, the place for me, it took me to the Baha'i shrines in, in Haifa. Mm -hmm. Uh, the music was distracting, and I'm sorry to say it, I don't want to be negative, but it was distracting because it's a beautiful song, but the the edits and the mixes were really very distracting. I mean, I do this professionally for a lot of very famous people. So I had to put headsets on just to, to be able to take, because it was volumes of certain things that were distorted, et cetera. And, and part of that has to do with you know, trying to play this on a Zoom. on a Zoom presentation, it's always going to be typically very difficult. So, yeah. but um, taking us through the form of meditation was wonderful, and it took me to where I needed to be, and that was in the shrines, 
and that was wonderful. But I just wanted to point out that that the styles of meditation, there's lots of them, but we're not given a specific discipline. Yes, I will actually I will read for you the passage um, that says the Baha'i writings do not prescribe any fixed procedures for meditation. However, it is clear that whatever its form, it entails focused reflection. Through meditation, the individual is able to gain new and valuable insights into abstract and practical matters. I like the practical matters. Yet placing too much emphasis on every idea that comes to mind during this process proves to be counterproductive because we have wayward thoughts, naturally. Some thoughts may be of little or no use. They are like waves moving in the sea without results. But if the faculty, which is very fascinating, that um, it is the word faculty is used. Faculty of meditation is bathed in the inner light and characterized with divine attributes. The results would be will be confirmed. That means we need confirmation. That means confirmation to me means God's will and God's mind has its own um, laws and patterns. And when we are aligned with that, we feel confirmation. In the world of nature, the same thing happens. When you plant a seed, if you plant it in, in harmony with the science, which is another God's laws, um, then you get confirmation by having the seed sprouting and growing and coming to full fruition. So confirmation basically for me in my mind is doing it the way either science or the spiritual laws of, of God has given us and then we bear the fruit. So here, um, the hope is to uh, receive confirmation. And that makes it even more important for me to use the prayers um, and try to align my own thoughts and fly on the wings of those thoughts rather than my own mm, thoughts regurgitating it or somebody else's thoughts, you know, mm, which is basically what we have. It doesn't matter what it is, poetry, whatever it is, is somebody else's thoughts. So. Uh, thanks for that note, by the way. Yes, give me a chance to share with you that passage, which is very important. Abdul Baha, by the way, did meditation while walking in, um, when he was in Paris. There was a park near his uh, place where he stayed and he went for a walk. Uh, when he was um, in Haifa, um, friends always talk about he would walk miles um, in the, in the, uh, on Mount Carmel, which was nothing but desert actually. And uh, so he would reflect and make in the guardian. Sometimes he would go to the mountains of um, Switzerland for 16 hours he would walk, especially initially, where he was told that he was the guardian. He, he, was, he, he had a very difficult time you know, digesting that and what it takes to be the guardian of the Baha'i faith. It was very torturesome for him. So he needed that reflection and that time to process and meditate. And then he said, I came back and I turned myself in. Shoghi Effendi died and the guardian was born. Basically, he's telling, you know, a transformation, a metamorphosis, spiritual happened. Thank you. Deanna, did you have your hand out or were you just stretching? You're, uh, you're muted. You're, you're muted. I can't see you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. I was just stretching, but, <laughs> but very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Michael has something. I see. Uh, so you mentioned that the Baha walking. So um, that influenced. Uh, I'm, I'll throw out a name, Tom Price. That many of you that are Baha'is have listened to lots of his music. He was one of the primary composers of the music for the World Congress in 1992. So when he's working on compositions, I know this because we work together on a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, there's a beautiful place uh, around his house in Australia. So he walks and composes. And, um, and, and it clears his mind to be able to to focus on what it is that his, he's needing to say either, either musically or lyrically. So um, uh, for a lot of us that, that take a walk, it's not just for exercise, but it's for 
uh, focus and clarity. And um, so I throw out, throw out a name with Tom Price because we've all, at least all the Baha'is have heard his music. Yes. You, I'm glad you showed me that. Um, you know, this bring me, brings to my mind the whole concept of multitasking, which a lot of people think we can do multitask, but in reality, neuroscience tells us, no, we basically we rotate back and forth, back and forth with, between different parts of the brain. So never anybody who does multitasking, we, we are not using the full, full brain at, at that time. Um, but uh, at the same time, I, rem I remember the story, many stories about Abdul Wahab, but this particular one, where he, uh, a very, uh, very well-known scholar for the first time came to uh, Janab Adib, the Adib means scholar, came to Holy Land, and um, they brought a huge bag of letters that Salman has brought from Iran of questions from the believers so Abdul Wahab could answer. And so Abdul Baha takes one of these questions and he gives it to Mr. Adib and tells you, you go and answer this one. It was very something from um, scriptures that he was supposed to answer. So he was a scholar of Islam, so it should have been easy. So he, he goes to his room and he wants a very special, sec, you know, uh, secluded place so, so he can work on it. And, all night, all night, he writes the answers and he doesn't like it and he just crumbles them, throws them to the side, writes again and he just crumbles them and throws them until morning, he hasn't slept, he's just kind of go crazy and he doesn't have anything and he's like feeling very, very, very um, worried and ashamed. So he comes back the next day, he's sitting there and um, everybody's talking, Abdul Baha is, is talking to the friends and um, so uh, finally, Abdul Baha says, um, Mr. Adib, did you, did you have a chance to write, <laughs> write the answer to this friend? And he says, my, my Lord, now I'm so ashamed. No, I, I couldn't. But Abdul Baha says, it's okay, don't worry. It's no big deal, no big deal. Just, just kind of give it to me. And so he gives it to Abdul Baha. And I, there are all these people, I mean, the, the, um, the mayor and sitting and all these non-Baha'is and Baha'is, whatever, they are all talking to Abdul Baha, Abdul Baha talking to them. As he's talking to them, he just writes the answer to this thing, and then he just gives it to Adib to um, go and you know um, put it in a room. And Adib is blown away, blown away how this this being, this Abdul Baha, could do that. How is it possible? But again, we have to just remember that there is um, special powers within each of us. And he says, look at me, follow me, me as I am. I don't know why he said that. But, <laughs> but um, just tells us who we are. And so we won't sell ourselves short in this world, becoming preoccupied with stuff that is not going to be worthy of, of our time. Thank you. Um, that's my excuse by saying I'm multitasking when I'm trying to do a whole bunch of stuff. So there goes my... Uh, <laughs> yeah, my I have no no respond uh, uh, no uh, no science behind it anymore. <laughs> okay. Any any other questions? Anything at all? We are coming close to our. Oh yes, uh, uh, Melani, you're you're muted. Hi. Um, when I was, thank you. For First of all, Kivan, for this wonderful presentation and the meditation and everything. And I love that passage from the writings. And as I was doing my little process that you were walking us through, um, the, the word that, that I ended up focusing on was received. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, a lot of what we've been talking about tonight, to me, Meditation is there's that listening part of it, you know, that you are in a state of quiescence, you know, where you are internally quiet mm -hmm. so that you can hear that voice, so that you can receive that um, stimulating spirit, mm -hmm. you know. So when Abdul Baha is walking, or when we walk, it, it's not random necessarily. I mean, it seems like there's an intentionality to it. Mm -hmm. You know, that you have opened yourself. Um, 
And then the sweetness of the melody of your own voice, your own intoning. It implies to me a uh, um, lack of ego. Mm -hmm. What makes something sweet, you know, in terms of our prayers or uh, interactions with people? We talk about, oh, somebody's so sweet. Yes. You know that there's a there's a lack of ego or a mm -hmm. diminishing of ego. Yeah. So. Yes, everybody can be sweet. Not everybody has a good voice. Right. So it has nothing to do with a good voice, but sweetness, spiritual qualities, everybody can have them while physical attributes, like I cannot be taller than I am. <laughs> there are so many things, we, you know, physical attributes we cannot change, but our spiritual attributes, we have every power to change them. And that is divine justice, by the way. So we can be greedy. <laughs> for our spiritual qualities. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. That's very true. Receive. I just love that word. That has been received by the, like, I sent you a letter and you got it. I know you got it. <laughs> so what did you do with it? <laughs> I put it on the shelf. <laughs> I don't remember where I put it. <laughs> Where's the action with that? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um. Ruth, did you have anything? Well, um, the last thing I wanted to share is I had invited um, a friend of mine from work to attend uh, our discussion. And um, I knew that he had some challenging things going on in his life. And uh, he sent me a message and it said, this meditation helped me more than I ever thought it would. I'm going to try and do it on a nightly basis. <laughs> oh, I thought that, that was very wonderful. humble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I had assistance. <laughs> no doubt in my mind. Excellent. Thank you Thank for you that. For that. I, I would suggest we keep each other in our prayers. And we really should use uh, the sweetness of, <laughs> of our melody to kindle every soul and we should do that for each other because then we have an orchestra going around the world which which we really need it because not not so sweet voices are very loud <laughs> we want to make sure that <laughs> we will we will do our share of sweetness put it out there fragrance um fragrant words and and powerful thoughts. Thank you for that, Ruth. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Avon, it's been yeah. absolutely wonderful. Thank you very, very so very much. Um, if there is, um, as of now, um, we don't have anything planned for, for the upcoming months. If there is any um, uh, topic that anyone is interested and you would like to be a presenter, please let Ruth and myself know. Um, this is a humble service that uh, we are piggybacking on CETL, um, CETL's uh, Zoom. <laughs> Thank you, CETL. And it has been an absolute pleasure since uh, I believe August or is it July? Oh, <laughs> before that, wasn't it June? June, yeah. You know, as if, uh, as if, uh, as my sister said once, that month of uh, March took 96 days. The rest <laughs> of the months are just going flying by really fast. So I think you're right. It was in June. Um, thank you so very much. I will um, send this uh, within the next 24 hours. Any other comments, anything else? And if not, we can adjourn. I want to thank you all so much. It gave me a chance to see some wonderful souls that I had not seen that had been the point of light in my life. I just looking at David <laughs> and Natalie and uh, and um, uh, uh, oh, oh, actually all of you guys and um, so much work um, you put into it. Uh, I I just command you and congratulate you, Fariba John and Ruth yes. and Cecil. And uh, Nadia in, in there, I saw Nadia and I got to meet, get to know Ruth and Michael 
uh, it's so wonderful. It has made a, um, for me a, a rich evening for me. I took a journey with you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really benefited from this. Thank you for this talk. Thank you. So you, everyone, have a wonderful night, and uh, we'll um, we'll be um, in touch um, through um, uh, in the next twenty four hours with a video. Thank have you. a great rest of the night. Alapa. Thank you so much. Alapa. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. I will give you a call in a second. Bye bye.